Why don't we get started? This looks good? Yeah. Okay, so I thought maybe the first thing we'll do is I found, I found some practice stuff on the internet. So there's a, I thought a pretty decent study guide kind of puts it all together. And then uh, we'll do this and then we could do some dynamic EKGs on the, uh, on the screen. Okay, so let's go through them and see what we think. Is, is the auto on? Okay, so let's look at the first one, and we'll try to do it like some type of uh, some type of system. Okay, so let's go heart rate first. So obviously, it looks like it's a little slow, right, or a lot slow. So what do we got? 300, 150, 100, 75, 60, 50, 40. So it's pretty slow. Okay. Now, so it's some type of bradycardia, and as far as the complexes go, they look like they're falling all regular. They all look like they have a P wave. They look like they have a QRS. The width of the QRS appears to be fairly narrow. They have a T wave. Doesn't look like there's any extra beats. So we'd say it looks like it has a rounded P wave. So I would say it looks like it's sinus in origin. And the rate is slow, it's below 60, so we call it bradycardia. So I think we would call this one sinus bradycardia. Anybody have any different things, any issues? Okay, so let's look at the uh, at number two. Okay, so number two again, heart rate wise, it's going to be a little harder to pick it out because it looks like there's some extra P waves and stuff. But you know, roughly it looks like 300, 100, 75, 60. So again, it's a little slow. We have what looks to be again normal sinus complexes, rounded P wave, narrow QRS, T wave. Okay, but the only thing that we notice is that what? The P to R intervals are doing what? Getting progressively longer, okay? So we have a normal P to R interval, a slightly longer, well again, what's this supposed to be the normal P to R interval? No, no wider than 0.20, right, five boxes. So they're getting slightly longer, and then now we see that we have what? A P wave that failed to conduct. So when we have this situation where we have groups of beats, if you were to look at it, the paper continuing, you'd see another group of beats. So we have P waves with gradually progressing P to R intervals, and then we have one P wave with no QRS after it. So this is going to be one of the AV blocks, the atrioventricular blocks. Anybody have any idea which one? Good. So it's a second degree type 1. Okay, I'll give you all the answers at the end. Okay, it's a second degree type 1 Winky Bach. Okay, symptomatic, not symptomatic? What do you think if a patient was in this? Non Usually non symptomatic, but it depends on how slow the heart rate is. Right, so like any bradycardia, if the heart rate's slow enough to affect the cardiac output, the patient can be, uh, can be symptomatic. But usually not. Would the patient even know that they're in this rhythm? Only if they feel the what? The skipped skipped beats. So they may say to you, I feel like my heart's skipping a beat. Okay. Would the patient feel anything in this rhythm? No. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. Okay. So it depends on if there's any, any perfusion with this rhythm or not, right? So usually we would call this a very, very coarse V-fib, right? I shouldn't say very coarse, but a coarse V-fib. Okay. Now, the difference between coarse and fine is what? When we say fine V-fib versus coarse V-fib, the difference would be what? The amplitude or height okay, of the complexes. So when later, I'm sure we're going to have a fine V-fib. When we see a fine V-fib, it's going to look very low amplitude. And we said that a fine V-fib untreated, or un maybe unsuccessfully treated, would eventually go into a systole, right? So this would be somebody who may have coded in front of you or may have coded in the last minute or two, okay? So a very, a very fresh code. And we do have the ability, okay, on a BLS level to very rapidly intervene and probably save this patient's life with good effective CPR, okay, and the early application of the external uh, AED, okay? And um, should hopefully, patient fresh like this, it should actually do what? We're going to defibrillate the heart and do what by defibrillating it? Stop it in the hopes that the normal pacemaker sites take over and put the patient back in a normal rhythm. 
So if this was just a patient's unlucky day and they were in a, you know, a sudden freak electrical disturbance with no heart attack as a precipitating factor or anything like that, they should actually, you know, reset and go back into a, a normal rhythm, especially when you see a course like this. Okay, now this one, what do we think? So this, this could really be, you know, without seeing the patient, this could be a lot of different things. This is obviously a wide rhythm, so we would call it ventricular in nature, okay? And the, it's changing in shape, and then we said shape is called morphology, right? So I would assume they're going to call this a polymorphic VTAC. That's a more dangerous VTAC than a monomorphic. So the difference between polymorphic and monomorphic is just are all the complexes the same shape. If it's monomorphic, mono means one, all the complexes are the same shape. Poly means many. So which one do you think would be worse? If you have one foci firing in the ventricles or you have multiple foci. In other words, if you have monomorphic, you have one irritable part in the ventricle that's firing. If you have polymorphic, you have many irritable sites. So obviously, polymorphic is more lethal than monomorphic. In fact, treatment-wise, polymorphic VTAC, you actually just defibrillate the patient. You don't even try to do anything fancier than that because it's considered that it's going to rapidly deteriorate into VFib. So I would assume they're going to call us a polymorphic VTAC. This is probably either somebody who says to you, I've been having crushing chest pain for hours, feel like I'm going to die, or it's somebody maybe that actually you, you know, defibrillated, okay, they went back into a normal rhythm and then they're going back into the V-fib and this is what you might see before they go back into the V-fib. So this is a very unstable rhythm. The defibrillator, okay, probably will shock this. If the rate is over 150, okay, which is a little hard because it's irregular, probably will shock it. Um, if it could find something to, you know, to kind of look at on it, because again, it's a little, you know, grossly irregular, it probably will shock it, and um, you know, probably would have a good outcome. It would be the appropriate treatment. How long would something like this last, Frank, before you see Depends how lucky you are. <laughs> no, really, that's what it comes down to. Is, you know, unfortunately in medicine, there's no hard and fast. I mean, you know, so uh, it, it really, you know, it really depends. I would not expect this patient to stay in it, you know, a polymorphic VTAC for, you know, an hour. But, it, you know, it could be a few minutes, you know, it could be 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Um, you know, everybody I've had who's been in a polymorphic VTAC has been that classic crushing chest pain in denial, looks ash. And the one you know when you walk in the door that it's not going to be a, you know, good outcome. And, uh, this would be somebody, if I saw that, I would have no qualms whatsoever at putting the defibrillation pads on the patient, even while they're still awake, just because I know that more than likely. Now, if I could quickly get an IV in this patient, the, the, you could try to give them amiodarone, okay? But really, if you followed the, the letter of the law, you know, and this patient was not, like if this person was wide awake and talking to you, I would say there's something wrong with the EKG. That would be my first diagnosis. You know, I'm missing something. There's maybe an electrolyte imbalance or something wrong. But if this guy looked ashen, looked like he was dying, the right treatment would be actually to just defibrillate it. Just fire it up and defibrillate him, you know, just like you would as if it was V-fib. Now, you know, if he was, if I was quick with the IV and I got an IV in and I thought I had the time, I would try to probably bolus him with a drug called amiodarone, which tends to relax the ventricular part of the heart and he might convert, you know, if he's very lucky. But again, with this rhythm, he may not have a good blood pressure. So if you give medications to somebody who doesn't have a good blood pressure, they may not circulate, so they may not get absorbed. So, but this would be, this would be a, uh, you know, definitely a trying rhythm, so. so. Okay, so now, what do we have? We have a regular rhythm. Okay, the rate is pretty fast, right? 300, 160 ish, say. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we notice is that what? It's a little, a little wide, right? The QRS complexes are a little wide. I shouldn't say a little wide, they're very wide, right? So this would again be a, so we have a ventricular rhythm at a rate of over 100. By definition, we have to call it VTAC. If it was under 100, what would we call it? an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Idio means within. And if it was between 40 and 60, okay, we would call it a idioventricular rhythm. Or 20 and 40, we call it idioventricular. Idio means within. So the normal intrinsic rate of the ventricles, we said, was 20 to 40. So if it's 20 to 40, it's idioventricular. 40 to 100 would be ventricular, I'm sorry, would be uh, accelerated idioventricular. And over 100 would be VTAC. 
Okay, so so all of the, it's all the same, just depends on the rate. So on the slow end, they may not perfuse just because it's too slow. Okay, a regular idioventricular rhythm may perfuse, and then on the high end, okay, they don't perfuse because what? When the heart's going so fast, we said there's decreased ventricular filling time. So I would call this just a straight VTAC, much better than number four, which was the polymorphic VTAC. So the treatment here, if the patient's stable, would be to get that IV, give them the amiodarone. But again, this could be unstable. So if this patient, and at 160, it probably is not going to be. You know, if the rate was over 200, I'd say probably the patient would be unstable. But if the, if the, you know, if the patient's stable, I would give them the amiodarone. If the patient's unstable, technically, it's a treatment called synchronized cardioversion, which is a fancier defibrillation. So the issue with defibrillation is the shock is administered when we tell it to, when we press the trigger. And we looked at, if you remember the first class, we looked at the EKG from the standpoint of what's going on in different parts of the heart. So if we said that if we were to draw a line right through the T wave, okay, everything on this side of the T wave is kind of used up, right? The muscle depolarized, it's, it's used up, nothing could make it stimulate again. On the downslope of the T wave, the heart is doing what? Repolarizing, getting ready. So if technically, it's a one in a thousand chance or one in a million chance, if the shock, if you were to shock somebody in that VTAC on the downslope when it's repolarizing, you could technically throw the patient into VFib. So cardioversion, the machine, the, the, the monitor, looks for the QRS, the highest point of the QRS, and delivers the shock right after it. So it's on the absolute refractory phase of the heart, not the relative refractory phase of the heart. So it's considered a safer way of shocking someone. Why don't we do that in VFib? Because VFib's totally chaotic and the machine can't sink on anything. So you're just shocking. And there's no chance of throwing a patient into VFib that's in VFib, so you don't have to worry about it. So this would be the same possibility. We talked about the kid struck in the center of the chest with the line drive baseball, the comio cortis, right? So it's the same thing, that if that blow falls on the downslope of the T wave, so remember, it's a double whammy for that kid. One, he gets hit in the right spot. Two, it's fast enough. And three, it happens in the right complex. It could technically throw him into VFib. So it's the same, you know, the same basic thing. So that patient, if he was stable, would get drugs, the top one, number five. If he was unstable, would get cardioversion. And if he was really unstable and the machine couldn't sink on it, when you put it into the cardioversion mode, the word sink comes up on the screen. And actually on the top of every QRS, it'll put a little symbol. Sometimes it's a heart, sometimes a triangle. And that's telling you the machine is actually sinking and knowing what it's looking at. Um, sometimes, well, not so much with the newer machines, but the older machines, sometimes they have problem sinking. So you could always turn up the gain, which makes the complex look a little bigger, and that would help it find it. Or if you had downward facing QRSs, like you do over here in number six, you could actually flip to a different lead where you'd have upward facing ones and it would be fine, it would be easier. But the new machines are, you know, pretty good with that. Okay, so number five, we're gonna call VTAC. Again, if the patient was unconscious and you put the AED on them, the machine technically would uh, shock them if the rate is over 150, and it does look like the rate is over 150 here, okay? So now number six, what do we have? So I think it's pretty easy that we could see the rate is pretty slow, okay, and dramatically slow. I don't know where the mouse went. Is the mouse coming up over there? Uh, oh, there it is, okay. Okay, so besides it being slow, we notice a couple things. The complexes are pretty wide, okay? The other, thing, the other thing I would say is that you don't see P waves every place they should be, but you see lots of P waves all over the place. And in some places you have more P waves than you have QRSs, so you obviously have some non-conducting P waves. So it could be a lot of different things. Most of the times it points to a AV block, right, or some type of AV block. Now, what would be like some people's thoughts on this? So I know which way we're working. Okay, so it could be a second degree type two or a complete heart block is one thing, okay? So let's look at trying to figure out the difference between it being a second degree type two and a complete heart block. So does everybody remember what we said the AV node does? 
So what is the AV, AV node supposed to do? Slow the impulses coming from the atrium down to the ventricles to allow the atrium to empty. When you have AV blocks, okay, most of them are not true blocks. Most of them are delays or intermittent blocks. The only one that's a true block where it blocks everything is the third degree. So a first degree, where we said we had a prolonged Peter R interval, the AV node is just holding it longer than it should. That's all it's doing, but then it lets it through. The second degree type one that we saw before, the Winky Bach, what is it doing? It's progressively holding each one a little longer. So we looked at, where is it? Here. If we looked at this one, it's holding this one not much at all, but holding this one a little longer, holding this one a little longer, and then it holds it so long that what? The ventricles didn't depolarize. So this is a second degree type one. A second degree type two, let's see. Let's see if we can find a second degree type two. Well, this would be one, but this is not a great one. Let me see if I can find another one. Okay, okay this would be a second degree type two. So here, what is the AV node doing? Some P waves, it blocks, doesn't let through. The reason we're seeing the P wave is the Remember, this is a block of the AV node, so the, everything above the AV node is working. So the SA node fired, it just never got through the AV node down to the ventricle. That's why you don't have a QRS. But occasionally it lets them through. So some it blocks, some it lets through. The ones where it lets through, you have constant P to R intervals. So that's showing there's still some relationship between the atrium and the ventricles. As compared to the third degree block, where you're still going to have more P waves than QRSs, but there's no constant Peter R interval. So that's telling you, like if you look at this one, now you still have more P waves than QRSs, but there's no constant Peter R intervals. You see they just fall randomly. So what's basically happening in this one, the complete heart block, is that the atriums are firing out those P waves. Every single one of them hits a wall at the AV node, doesn't get down to the ventricles. Why does the patient not die? Because we have those backup pacemakers. So what does the ventricle start to do? Fire is slow, 20 to 40. So if you were to actually be able to map this out, the distance from here to here would be the distance from here to here, would be the distance from here to here, distance from here to here, okay? So one P wave is probably hidden in this QRS, which means the atrium is firing regularly, and if you mapped out the R to R's, right, you got one to here to here, they're firing out regularly. So the atrium's firing perfectly, assuming that all its complexes are getting down to the ventricles, none are, and the ventricles fire up, and they fire regularly at a rate of slow because they're only intrinsically can fire at 20 to 40. So these patients probably, you know, are unstable, um, very weak, probably can't lift their heads up, may even be unconscious, okay? Um, the true treatment is they need a new pacemaker, okay? Short term, they can get externally paced. Drugs typically do not work, especially when you have such a slow heart rate with a fairly wide QRS. You could try atropine, okay, but it's probably not going to work. And if it does, it may only be a slight increase in the heart rate. But uh, they need to be probably short-term pre-hospitally, externally paced in the hospital to have a you know, permanent placemaker inserted. That's what would happen with, uh, you know, with these patients. They may just transvenously pace, pace them in the hospital as a short-term. That would be the intermediate step between us pacing them with external pads. They can do a transvenous pacemaker, and then they would have ultimately implant a... Uh, you know, a regular pacemaker. So if it was like Sunday, you'd get a transvenous pacemaker to Monday. You know, if it was during the week, during business hours, you'd probably, you know, if get the transvenous pacemaker for an hour until you get up to uh, the OR and get a, uh, you know, a regular pacemaker put in. Okay. So can everybody see, I mean, I, I should have actually cut these up a little bit and put similar ones together, but uh, can everybody see what's happening here? So again, you have the sinus node working perfectly. Unfortunately, the AV node is stuck. Nothing's getting through. So the ventricles fire up. How do you tell the difference between this one and the next one? This does not have constant PDR intervals. And there's a little chart in one of the handouts that tells you how to differentiate them. And that's exactly you know, what it tells you in that little chart, how you would differentiate between the different types of heart blocks. Okay, let's just quickly go down to that second degree type two and look at the difference. So again, here you have more P waves, but you see that the PDR intervals are constant. So that's why this would be a second degree type two. Now, the other one that's a little confusing, number 11 on fa first pass, 
okay? You know, if I looked at it quickly, this was three o'clock in the morning, you know, I would call that a, you know, a sinus rhythm. The only thing that would shock me a little bit, you know, or not shock me or perk my interest is, you know, it's definitely some T wave depression down there, okay? And it's a little wide to QRSs. But really, if you looked at it carefully, this is a P wave and this is a P wave. So you have an extra P wave for every complex. So this would also, this is a hard rhythm, so don't, don't beat yourself up if you didn't see that at first. But this would also be a second degree type two. Okay, so the reason it's a second degree type two is that the P waves in front of the QRSs are constant Peter intervals, right? So that's why it's gotta be a second degree type two and not a complete heart block. So this is a, but that's a, a little more challenging rhythm. Okay. Okay, so what do we have here? So we have a rate of about 300, 150, 100, so say 80 ish. Narrow, narrow QRSs. Do we have a P wave in front of every QRS? Okay. Now, what do we notice? That the P waves are way in front, greater than the little boxes, right? Four or five little boxes. So is it sinus in origin? Looks rounded, right? So we would call this a normal sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block. So first degree is a benign, just a prolonged PDR interval. And uh, you know, that's probably all that's wrong with that you know, patient. So can you see that slightly prolonged PDR interval? Mm -hmm. For some reason, all these strips, you know, they're presenting with these depressed T waves that I know a lot of people are fixating on and stuff. You know, just pretend they're not there. Okay, there's, there's, they're not of any clinical significance in anything that we're doing tonight. Okay, number eight. So this is another slow one, right? So what do we got here? 300, 150, 175, 60, 50. So heart rate's slow, okay? So it's below 60. Now, narrow QRSs, and the thing that strikes us here is the P waves are what? Inverted. Okay, so a slow heart rate with an inverted P wave, okay, until proven otherwise, we would call what? A junctional or nodal, some people call it nodal. The old way was called nodal because the AV node. Okay, so a junctional or nodal rhythm. This would be treated exactly the same if it was a sinus bradycardia that, that was symptomatic. So the only reason this patient may call you is that they're just not beating enough times a minute and they feel weak. So there's, you know, there's really no difference, but the only thing physiologically in the body is what, what are you knowing now? In other words, if it was sinus bradycardia, the dominant pacemaker is the SA node. If it's junctional bradycardia, the dominant pacemaker is what? The AV node. So that means they've knocked out one primary pacemaker. They're in their second one. If that goes, they're down to a ventricular rhythm. So maybe from that standpoint, it's a little more you know, ominous. Okay, everybody can see the inverted P waves and the slow rate. What would you do, just give atrophy? If they were unstable, you could try atropine. Supposedly, one of the things they believe atropine does is it improves conduction through the AV node. So it might slightly pick it up. Um, if the patient stayed in this junctional rhythm, I'm pretty sure they would get a pacemaker. Would they need to be externally paced in the field? It would depend on whether or not they're symptomatic or not. But yeah, this would, be a, uh, this would probably be another atropine uh, type of patient. Okay, so here we have a rhythm somewhere 300. 150, 100, 75, so rhythm about 75. But what strikes us right away is that we have what? We have this sawtooth pattern, okay? Which right away would lead us to thinking of a uh, atrial flutter, right? Now, not all the time, okay? In fact, I think in this set there's one where it it's, looks like it is and it's not, but it's okay. now. The rate is not fast because not every one of those flutter waves, which is what we would really call P waves, but you know, flutter waves is getting down. If for some reason, every one of those flutter waves gets down, now we're gonna double the rate, like right off the bat. So that's the danger of atrial flutter is that you know, if it actually conducts all the way through, the patient would be going very, very fast. So at this rate, the patient probably doesn't even know they're in atrial flutter because it's nice and regular and they may not even know that they're, you know, an atrial flutter. If all of a sudden it picks up, they'll know right away. Okay. 
Okay, so another like pretty bad looking rhythm just because it's all over the place and you got this big, you know, T waves, ST, ST elevation up there and stuff like that. So this could be somebody technically, you know, if you saw this at multiple leads, you'd be a little concerned about it if they were telling you they're having chest discomfort or abdominal discomfort. But what do we see? Re pretty much a narrow QRS, but the R to R's are what? Regular or not regular? Irregular. Totally irregular. Can you make out any P waves? Not atrial flutter. It looks like it's a, a okay, not quite sawtooth. Mm -hmm. Right, it's irregularly irregular. That's the good term. Totally irregular or irregularly irregular, which means that there is no constant P waves, no atrial, regular atrial activity, and then the R to R's are totally irregular. So if you can't pick out any clear P waves, now I'm not talking about maybe once in a while you see a P wave, but I'm talking about you can't consistently pick out P waves, and the R to R's, the ventricular, is totally irregular. By definition, that would be atrial fibrillation, okay? So, and that's what this is. It's atrial fibrillation with possibly some, you know, again, we're only looking at it in one lead, but possibly some ST elevation. So if this guy was saying to you, you know, I feel like my heart's beating irregularly and I have chest pain or abdominal discomfort, you know, and stuff like that, it would probably be a good story for somebody who maybe went into a nuance at AFib, secondary to maybe having a heart attack, or maybe he's just having chest pain because they're in nuance at, you know, AFib. So, I remember we said the danger of AFib is what? Clots. Clots is one. The other problem is that when your atriums are fibrillating, there's not a lot of blood going down to the ventricles, and if your heart rate's over 100, then your ventricular filling time slows. So you have two issues. You have not enough blood getting from the atrium to the ventricles, plus the ventricles can't fully fill, so you have decreased cardiac output. So if it was long term and they weren't anticoagulated, yes, clots. Okay, if it's short term, then it's just cardiac output types of issues. So this person technically could go into pulmonary edema, right, because they can't push all that blood out of their left ventricle, so it could back up into their lungs. They could hyperperfuse, okay, and just feel weak and dizzy. So this, and, and this could be transient. You know, this could be somebody calls and says, you know, I feel like my heart's beating irregularly. You get there, and it's in a totally normal rhythm. You leave, and it calls you back and says it's happening again. And that's somebody who has to get put on what? Well, one, we have to take them to the hospital, but two, a Holter monitor, right? So they get this paracyxmal on and off. It keeps on kicking in and on. So they got to put on a Holter monitor for a couple of days, and then they'll analyze it and catch them in those, you know, different rhythms. So that could be somebody just, you know, has a lot of stress, and when they think about the stress, they go into AFib, and then, you know, they have their... Uh, anti-anxiety medication, they go out of AFib, or they have a little drink and they, they go out of AFib. So, uh, you know, stress is one of the biggest reasons why, you know, sometimes people go in and out of uh, AFib. Okay, this one we said before was the little tricky one that would be another second degree type two, so that this would be a P wave and this would be a P wave. Can you see the mouse up there? Yes, okay. So this would be a P wave and this would be a P wave. Very hard, you know, to pick it up, but the reason it's a secondary head too is that the P waves that fall in front of the QRSs have constant P to R intervals. Okay, here's another guy that looks like he's got some ST elevation, but let's go through it. So we got a P wave, okay? We have a narrow QRS. I know that it didn't print very well, okay? That's a lot of times what happens when it falls on a solid line. It's, it's a little hard to see sometimes. We got a P wave. Okay, narrow QRS, T wave, P wave, narrow QRS, T wave. So, P to R interval, a little getting towards long, but not terribly long. Okay, but I'd say it's still probably within that, you know, range. It might just be on the borderline. But, the, you know, the thing, that, the thing that would strike us here is there's definitely, you could see the S wave doesn't come all the way down. It meets the T wave, doesn't come down to the isoelectric line. So, again, if this guy was saying to us, you know, I don't feel well, I got nausea, I got chest pain, I got shortness of breath, I got abdominal discomfort, and he was in this rhythm, he would be worthy of a 12 lead, probably be worthy of giving some aspirin just to be on the safe side, okay? So now the underlying rhythm, we have rounded P waves with narrow QRSs, and the rate is what, 300, 150, 100, 70, 80-ish? So it's sinus, it's between 60 to 100, so we just call this a regular sinus rhythm or a normal sinus rhythm. Okay, I don't try to use normal sinus rhythm, but I usually call it regular sinus rhythm, okay, RSR, at a rate, you know, and I would say the only thing that's kind of uh, a little impressive here is the, you know, ST elevation 
on the patient. Okay, any questions on that one? <coughs> now is the time if you, uh, you know, I think we're done after tonight. Okay, so this one we looked at. So before somebody calls it out, let's go through and, you know, think about it in our heads for a second. We have more P waves than we have QRSs, but we have constant P to R intervals. So what we would call that one? Second degree type 2 right? Versus a complete heart block where we would not have constant, and a complete heart block is called a third degree heart block where we would not have constant p um, r intervals. Okay, here's a very busy one. So when you see one that's busy like this, first find the complexes that are the most common and assume that is your underlying rhythm. And then the ones that are extra, you're going to call extra or premature or, you know, whatever you want to call it. So, the ones that are the most common, okay, I would say are, that all look the same, are these, this one, this one, do we have one maybe over here? So let's look at those for a second, okay? The rounded P wave, narrow QRS, okay, the rate is what, 300, 150, so a little faster than 100, okay? So it's going to be hard to know the patient's total heart rate because of what? We don't know if those extra beats are doing what? Generating a pulse or not, right? So you don't really know, you know what the patient's heart rate is going to be, but they're definitely not bradycardic, okay? And they're not dangerously tachycardic. So it looks like we have what? An underlying sinus rhythm, possibly an underlying sinus tachycardia, with some extra beats. Now, we, all the extra beats that we have we call premature, okay? And we have to decide if they're premature junctional I'm sorry, premature atrial, premature junctional, or premature ventricular. So right off the bat, how are we going to tell the difference? The width of the QRS, right? And whether or not there's, okay, possibly a P wave or not a P wave or anything like that. So if it's a wide QRS, right off the bat, you're pretty safe to call it a premature ventricular beat, okay? Now, when you call it a premature ventricular beat, then you have to say, are all the complexes, the premature complexes, the same shape? So the answer there is yes. Mm -hmm. So they would call that unifocal, meaning one foci in the atrium, I'm sorry, one foci in the ventricles is irritable and firing when it's not supposed to. If it was multifocal, okay, that would mean there would be many PVCs of different shapes, which would tell you there's many parts of the ventricle that's irritable. So again, what's more serious, one crabby part of your heart or multiple crabby parts of your heart? Mm -hmm. Multiple, right? So. Now, this particular one has two in a row. So there's a special term when you have two called a couplet. Okay, so this would be a normal sinus rhythm, okay? You could say with unifocal PVCs and a couplet. Now, again, we're looking at a couple seconds of the strip. If this starts repeating itself, having two PVCs in a row is more concerning than having an occasional PVC because technically, if you start having three PVCs in a row, you're at great risk to staying in PVCs. And if you stay with just PVCs, you're in VTAC, right? So in other words, if all of a sudden, this just started careening across the screen at a rate of over 100, you would be in VTAC. If this started careening across the screen at a rate of under 100, you'd be in accelerated ventricular. So either way, it's the ventricles that become the dominant pacemaker, and we don't want that. Okay, can everybody see those? Okay, 15. 15 <coughs> is a little, I would say, challenging. Okay, so what do we have? We have a heart rate of 300, 150, 100, so say 125, 130. Okay, so we have a tachycardia. We have narrow QRSs, but what's interesting, is it regular? No, but we clearly have P waves. The P waves are not rounded, so this would be a, a complex that's not starting in the um, sinus node, but starting in the atrium somewhere. And then what's the other thing that's kind of interesting about the P waves? They change, the shapes, right? So this is telling us that multiple parts, you know, if it was all the same P wave, 
and they were pointy, we'd say that they, there's one part of the atrium that's become the pacemaker. Not the sinus node, but someplace in the atrium has become the pacemaker. In this one, there's multiple places in the atrium that has become the pacemaker, which is why your P waves look different, because there's multiple sites that are firing. So because the rate is fast over 100, we call it MAT, M-A-T, multifocal atrial tachycardia. Okay, so if you want to stump, you know, one of your know-it-all paramedics and stuff, start throwing out these. They ask them, what's MAT and what's WAP? So if it was rate below 100, okay, it's called wandering atrial pacemaker. Don't ask me who thought of these. I mean, at least multifocal atrial tachycardia sounds medical. You know, wandering atrial pacemaker reminds me of the wandering Jew in the desert type of thing, you know, so I... Uh, you know, I don't know if uh, I don't know if I would uh, you know particularly think of that one as being medical. So it's like you have the the wandering the wandering cardiac impulse in your heart trying to find a home. You know. So would the patient call you for any reason if they were in this rhythm? Well, they may feel a little dizzy because they're going fast. Okay, and they may actually feel that the heart's not beating regularly. Some people have that sensation when their heart is not beating regularly. So they may notice. Especially when your heart rate increases, because what do you get? You get that pounding feeling, right? So now they may feel that little bit of pounding. Think of you ran, and you got that pounding sensation. But it doesn't fall one right after the other. You notice it's skipping around a little bit. You kind of say, hmm, that doesn't feel right. Most of us would never, ever, ever call an ambulance or go to the hospital. We just hope it would go away and stuff like that. So, But, uh, you know, I had, I was... I was studying for a test and I was laying in bed. This is actually not that long ago. And you know, so I had a pillow behind my head and I was studying and all of a sudden I hear my pulse. So I'm going, hmm. So I switch from studying to Google and I say, <laughs> hearing pulse and then it's called uh, pulsatile tinnitus. Okay, so I'm like, okay, so let's look up pulsatile tinnitus. You gotta love, you don't really need to be a doctor anymore, right? I bought my wife a mug and says, I did not get my medical degree from Google, so don't question my decisions, you know? <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so I look up pulsatile. So some of it says it's nothing, some of it says, then one of the things it says is, you know, dangerous disease of your arteries in your head and this, that, and so I'm going, okay, so one part of it says it's nothing, it'll just go away, and the other part of it says I'm gonna die. Okay, let's keep on studying. <laughs> if I die, I don't have to take the test and stuff, so. But that's what most, you know, most people in medicine were, you know, even though we know all the things it could be, we would never, you know, never look at uh, getting help or anything like that. Okay, so can we see the different looking P waves and the, uh, the tachycardia? So we're going to call that one multifocal atrial tachycardia. Okay, so what do we got here? We have a rate of 300, 150, so say 160-ish. Okay, narrow QRSs, so we're going to call that, you know, at least we can call it you know, tachycardia, atrial tachycardia, or supraventricular tachycardia, because it narrow the uh, narrow QRSs. Okay, but now, what about P waves? Spiky. Okay, possibly spiky. Okay, so that would be called atrial. So, what do you think we would call this one? So it's fast, so we have to call it tachycardia, right? It's narrow, so we're going to call it supraventricular. If you want to be totally safe and have nobody really technically could challenge your diagnosis, you call it supraventricular tachycardia. Because all you're saying is it's a tachycardia that originates above the ventricles, so you're safe. It could be atrial tachycardia, it could be junctional tachycardia, it could be anything, but you'd be safe. If you wanted to be a little more specific, okay, then you would probably call it atrial tachycardia or paroxysmal atrial tachycardia, sudden onset atrial tachycardia, okay, PSVT, so, or PAT, okay. So again, pointy P waves, okay, and a narrow QRS at a heart rate of over 100, we'd call that, you know, SVT to be on the safe side. Can you go back to 15 to show the differences between 15? Sure. So, first of all, here the rate is a little slower, right, just a little, but again it's irregular so it's a little hard to tell. But here the P waves, okay, are a little more rounded, a little more flatter than this is. Okay, and the morphology of the P waves changes. Here on 16, the morphology of the P waves is what? All the, all the same. So if this was regular and all the P waves are the same, it would be this one down here. If 15 was regular and all the P waves, I'm sorry, you call them P waves, but all the A waves or atrial waves, or I guess we call them P waves, all the atrial waves are the same, it would be PSVT. Because the P waves are changing, and that's what's causing the irregularity, we would call that uh, MAT, multifocal atrial tachycardia. 
I think the main thing that most people misdiagnose multifocal, multifocal atrial tachycardia was actually AFib because they see it being irregular. The difference between AFib is what? That you can clearly make out P waves. Where in AFib, you can't make out any P waves. You just see those little fibrillatory waves. Okay, I don't remember how many there are. Two more? Okay, so here's another, you know, clearly uh, funkier rhythm. Okay, but if we, if we take a second to kind of look at it, we have a P wave, okay, a fairly narrow QRS, but we have T waves that have, you know, definitely inverted T, uh, T waves. So this is not what we call ST depression because the S wave comes back up to the isoelectric line. If you look like over here, you see it's coming back up. It would be ST depression if the, the, the wave stopped here and then followed over. So this is just depressed T waves. This could be an electrolyte issue, could be an old cardiac injury and stuff like that. Uh, it could be nothing. So, but underlining it, under, the underlying rhythm is otherwise what? Yeah, looks pretty sinusy, okay. Um, you know, so other than those depressed T waves that we'd have to kind of figure out, this would be like a blood work type of thing, figure out maybe, you know, their electrolytes are off or something like that. This is an underlying sinus rhythm. The rate is not very fast, right? We've got 300, 150, 100. Yeah, so the rate's under 100. So this would just be a sinus rhythm. And this is, you know, this is a good one because we always think of a sinus rhythm as just looking totally normal, totally relaxed. And, and this is here one where really it's an underlying sinus rhythm but with this, you know, inverted T wave. So we have to figure out from that standpoint what's going on. But we never treat the rhythm. So if the patient, you know, called us and said they stubbed their toe and for some reason, you know, we put them on the monitor and we saw that, we'd have to assume that this is not bothering the patient, right? And it's just they called us for a different reason. So the patient may always have that. And then the last one, okay, so here we have now the question is, what's the normal ones and what's the extra ones, right? So the normal ones typically are the upright narrower ones. So we have a P wave QRS, okay, and probably a little T wave over here. Then we have an extra beat, P wave, okay, QRS, T wave, extra beat, PRS. But what do we notice? For every good beat, we have a what? A wide, premature, ventricular, okay, complex. So here we have Multifocal PVCs or unifocal PVCs? Unifocal. But the thing that's striking us is a little strange is that we have one P wave, I'm sorry, one PVC for every normal complex. So this would be called a normal sinus rhythm with what? Ventricular bigeminy. Bigeminy is one for one, trigeminy would be two for one, okay, quadrigeminy and so on, okay? So that would be a, you know, and again, this would be a little more concerning than the occasional PVC just falling out there, but it, the patient's calling you saying their stomach's bothering them or, you know, they have a headache, it probably has nothing to do with this particular rhythm. Okay, so any questions on any of those that we went over? Yes? It's a, a normal sinus rhythm with ventricular bigeminy. Okay. So somewhere we have um, a sheet with all the... Uh, all the answers we'll give you out before you leave. We just have to, I don't know where I stuck everything in the dark. Okay. So let's, uh, let's look at a couple. Let's look at a couple over here and then we could practice for a little bit. What time is it? 819? Okay. So this is probably a little more realistic than looking at just a, you know, a fixed strip on a piece of paper. Although it's always nice to, you know, if you really think you have to make a diagnosis, nothing is better than looking at, you know, something not moving across the screen. So what do we have here? So it's telling us the heart rate is 72. We clearly have P waves, QRSs and T waves. They're narrow, falling at a regular basis. So, you know, this would be a, a clear normal sinus rhythm. Let me go to some of the ones that we really, you know, didn't touch on too much. And then we could do it as a test. So sinus arrhythmia. A in front of anything means without, okay, or abnormal or something like that. So arrhythmia means without rhythm, 
Okay. So this is a sinus rhythm that's irregular for no other reason than probably just a normal healthy person where their breathing is throwing it off a little bit. Okay. So, you know, not much other than that. Typically happens in, you know, younger people, has to do with respiratory patterns, and it just confuses people into whether there's PACs or not. Okay. But it's, they all look the same. Okay. There's no real, you know, change. And then every so often they come out of rhythm. So there's nothing, you know. So this would be if you see a younger person, say under the age of uh, 25 with a slightly irregular rhythm, and you could clearly make out P waves, I would call it a sinus arrhythmia. It wouldn't be AFib or anything like that. Now, I've never had much luck telling the difference between a sinus exit block and a sinus arrest. Okay. But, you know, here you have basically these huge pauses, okay, with no P waves. The other one you're going to see some P waves, so that might be the easiest way, but you just have these big pauses, okay, where for some reason, okay, the impulse is not getting down and conducting. But everything else is falling regular. So it can't be a winky box because you don't see the widening of the Peter R interval like you would usually have with a Mobitz 1. I'm sorry, a second degree heart block Mobitz 1. Okay. So this patient probably would call just because they feel their heart rate, you know, being irregular and it's a little bradycardic. Now the sinus arrest. Hold on. Okay, fairly similar you know, in, in appearance, okay? So here it's again, it's just not getting the, the SA node is not firing. So the first one, the SA node was firing technically over here, okay? It's firing, okay, but the impulses are not getting down. And this one, the SA node is not firing. I don't know how they would make that diagnosis. To me, it kind of looks, you know, fairly similar. Oops. But, um, I've probably only seen this about two or three times where people have this, typically older people. Okay. And whether or not they're sick or not depends on how slow the, uh, the heart rate is. Oops. So here's a paced atrial rhythm. And what do we notice? Pacemaker spikes. You see how small they are? So a lot of times you're going to miss the pacer spike, especially if you put the patient on in the ambulance and you're moving, you know, and you're doing a bunch of different things, you're going to miss the pacer spike on those patients. When it tends to be a ventricular paced rhythm, you're going to have a wide QRS, so that might prompt you to look a little more, but when it's just an atrial paced rhythm, a lot of times, since it's all it's doing is starting the whole complex and then everything goes down through the ventricles normally, you're going to get a narrow QRS. So you may not notice that. You may notice the patient may tell you to have a pacemaker, or you may notice that the, uh, there's a bump on the patient's chest or a scar or something like that. But sometimes, you know, you could definitely miss this. Now, I don't think this one has a AV sequential pacer, but I believe it did have a ventricular paced rhythm. Yeah, here's... So you see the difference here? This is just... Pacer spike, which again is pretty hard to pick up. Okay, pacer spike in what? Wide QRS. So the atrium is not being paced, but because it's pacing the ventricle and the wire is what? The wire from the pacemaker is just touching. That's an interesting question to find out where does the wire actually go onto the ventricle, but it's going somewhere onto the ventricle. So what has to happen to the electrical impulse now? It's going from the wire to some part of the ventricle and it's got to travel around the whole ventricle. So because it's not going down the bundle branches and the Purkinje fibers, it goes slower. You know, a couple of milliseconds slower, but it goes slower. And what do you get? The wide QRS. But you can see it's, it'd be hard sometimes to pick those up. Like if you just looked at that, you know, with a heart rate of 80, I'd call that an accelerated ventricular rhythm if I missed that pacer spike, right? That, that would technically be a wide rhythm at a rate of, you know, over 40 to 60, or I'm sorry, 20 to 40, so I'd call that an accelerated ventricular rhythm if you missed that little pacer spike. And it's hard to see it. So here's an accelerated ventricular. Does it look much different? Here's, here's the pacer, accelerated. You know, I'm sorry, accelerated. Only thing you're missing is that tiny little, spike. right, that tiny little spike, right? Because really, what is this pacemaker doing? 
you know, for all intents and purposes, it's making a ventricular rhythm. Right? It's, it's only depolarizing the ventricles. I don't know how many people just get a ventricular pacemaker or an atrial pacemaker anymore. Most of the people I've seen recently who have pacemakers put in, you know, have what they call an AV sequential. So you're going to see a spike P wave, spike QRS. They have what's called an AV sequential. I'm sure if your atriums are working, your SA node is working, maybe they just put a ventricular one in. Okay, I don't know. I don't know, you know, what makes you get one over the other, but that's... Uh, Did you see the P wave? The yes, if you had an AV... properly. Um, that's a good point. Yeah, I guess technically you would see a P wave if the atrium was working properly. So I don't really know enough. For this one, the heart would be, I mean, the ventricle would be filling via gravity. Yes. I mean, it would not be... Right. You, unless, unless there is atrial activity and we just don't see it because of something about the pacemaker. I don't know enough about, I'll be honest with you, I don't know enough about pacemakers to, to talk intelligently about it. But I could try to, you know, do some research. So sometimes, you know, because now they get that pacemaker in place, maybe somehow it's masking. And you don't see the atrial activity or something like that. You know, I don't know. So. What I what I can't show you, but maybe we could look for a second, is something called um, failed capture, which is probably a little more of a reason why we would get called. Am I spelling this right? No. Uh, let's see the best one. So here, you see, you just have pacer spikes. Is this coming up on the screen? Yeah. So you see, I just have a spike with no QRS after it. And then these, ca these captured, these didn't. So this could happen more commonly when we externally pace someone where we don't have the energy high enough. But this could happen if someone could call you and say, I have a pacemaker, I don't think it's working, I feel very weak and dizzy. And you put them on a the monitor and you see just pacer spikes with non-conduction, okay? Now the other thing is there's no guarantee where you see those pacer spikes and QRSs that that's actually mechanical capture. You're seeing what? Electrical capture. The only way you know there's mechanical capture is checking a pulse. So this person is laying in bed saying, I feel really weak and dizzy, and you see him at pace rhythm at 80, and you're kind of like, you know, why? You got to feel for a radial pulse to make sure all those are conducting, because all you're looking at in a piece of paper is electricity, right? This is not telling you anything mechanically is working. Remember, you could have somebody in a totally sinus rhythm, and they could be dead. That's called what? Pulseless electrical activity. That means that there's no pulse with a normal rhythm, and then you have to figure out why would that happen. Okay, did they bleed out? You know, what's the problem? Why would they have a totally normal electrical activity on a piece of paper and have generating no pulse with it? Okay. So that's a, you know, that's a classic failed capture. Um, this patient may need to be, you know, depending on what the situation, may need to have their pacer settings adjusted. Okay, maybe the wire slipped. That's always a common thing. Can, when mm -hmm. you feel the pulse, when you feel it, will the pulse be irregular? In this patient, yeah. If, yeah. if these were conducting, if the, well, if, you, if these were not conducting, you would never find a pulse, right? But let's say these are conducting, this is nothing, nothing, and then this one, sure, you'd have a big pause. So you'd so you, have an Yep, pulse. so you'd be beep, 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 okay. and then beep, right? So you definitely clearly have an irregular pulse, yes? So that would be a clue then, if you have a sure. guy with a pacemaker and he's having an irregular yep. pulse. Yep. So if you have somebody with a pacemaker and they have, you know, an irregular pulse, it's probably either the pacemaker. You, you could have pacemakers that are what they call demand pacemakers. It'll only fire if the rate goes below a certain rate. Mm -hmm. And you got pacemakers that are on all the time. So if you had somebody who had a demand pacemaker and their heart rate was 80, maybe their pacemaker's not firing. Mm -hmm. And it would only come on if they're bradycardic. But let's say that this is actually one that's on all the time. Yes, if the heart rate's irregular, then there's some problem that the pacer is not firing on a regular basis because you should not have an irregular heartbeat. The only time they may have a paced rhythm with an irregular heartbeat is they're having some premature beats, some PVCs or something like that. They could have a slightly irregular beat if those PVCs are actually conducting. And our background beeps don't tell us it's, ir it's irregular. Okay. So again, we said that this is the accelerated ventricular. And the only difference between an accelerated ventricular and, and, and idioventricular is what? 
race, uh, rate, not race, rate, right? So in other words, ideal means within the ventricles. If it's within the ventricles, the rate has to be within 20 or 40. Accelerated means it's faster than 20 to 40, so it's less than 100, because if it was 100, it would be VTAC. Okay. So remember my feeling of silencing the EKG or the alarms, right? So it's nice to hear, I mean, you don't have to have the thing screaming, but it's nice to hear that beeping noise, because if it becomes irregular, after a while, your ears will come, you know, right now you're just listening to the stuff for the first time, but you're, you'll be able to tell what's going on by listening to the beeps. You know, if it becomes irregular, you'll notice it. What's the rate that you would call it VFib? No rate, zero rate. So VFib has no heart rate. VFib is just the, the ventricles just shaking and quivering. There's no organized electrical activity. And there's no rhythm, there's no rate, there's no nothing. It's total, you know, total just death. Right, so if you had VFib, and again, this would be a probably fine to, you know, moderately, possibly coarse VFib. So there's no, none of those little complexes are actually contracting. That's just shaking. That's just the muscle of the heart shaking. Let me see if I can get a... can't see the keyboard. So, you see here that the, well, probably a little clearer over here. I don't know where I went to. So, here the height okay, of the complexes is much higher. Now, it would be very hard to tell if this is just a polymorphic VTAC or a coarse VFib. So the easiest way to know the difference if it's a polymorphic VTAC or a coarse VFib is is the patient alive or dead. Okay, if the patient's dead, it's clearly a coarse VFib. If the patient's dead and it's a polymorphic VTAC, they're still technically treated as VFib, so it doesn't matter. So all this is showing you is that the myocardium, if this was coarse VFib, the myocardium is fresh, still with oxygen and sugar, so it could quiver with more force. And as the minutes go by and it gets no more fresh oxygen and sugar, and it depletes its reserves, what does it do? It shakes with less force, right? This is just like if your muscle's twitching, that's exactly what this is doing. This is just a muscle not contracting, just twitching. That's all it is. So. Okay. Uh, where's that? Okay. Uh, so here we have a, in some of the complexes, right, P wave QRS, P wave QRS, but we also have some complexes that happen a little earlier than we would suspect, and there is no P wave. So this would be an underlying normal sinus rhythm, P wave, narrow QRS, T wave, at a rate of under 100, but we happen to have some extra beats, and there's no P wave in front of them or there would be possibly an inverted P wave, so we just call that a PJC. The reason it's not a sinus rhythm with PACs is that here, again, you have a P wave, QRS, T wave, P wave, QRS, T wave. You have an earlier beat here, but you could see a P wave, so this would be a PAC. Um, trying to think what else. Well, we had our junctional rhythms. Okay, so again, bradycardia with no P wave, a little faster. So here, rate 40 to 60. Here, rate over 60, right? Because normally it should be 40 to 60. Now it's a little faster. And what do you notice about the P waves? They're inverted. And then, okay, not that we'd ever really pick it out, but a junctional tachycardia, okay? So we really can't make out any kind of P waves or anything like that on it, but we would probably, most of us, just call this SVT. Okay, and then the heart blocks. P wave for every QRS, but the P to R interval is longer than normal. So this would be a normal sinus rhythm with a first degree of E block. Here we have, let me let it go a little further. Okay, 
So here we have slightly long or very long Peter R interval, longer Peter R interval, longer Peter R interval, and then what? Just a dropped, just a P wave with no ventricular, and then this, it repeats itself, okay, over and over again. So this one be a second degree type one that's sometimes called Winky Bach. Okay. Here's a, let me just wait for it to go across. Okay, so here we have P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS, P wave, QRS. Okay, so all of this looks fine. But then we have a situation where we just have a P wave floating out there. Now we have a situation where there's two P waves floating out there. So we're saying, wait a second, there's more P waves than QRSs. So the next thing you'd want to see is that are all the P waves that are falling in front of QRS is constant? And the answer is yes. yes. So this would be a second degree type two. Now this is probably the, the calmest second degree type two I've seen. You know, it doesn't usually have that many conducting complexes, that many normal complexes. This one might be a little better. Yeah, this is a little better. So here we have normal complex, okay? And then we just have the P wave floating out here. That's why they're calling it two to one. So you're having two P waves for every QRS. But that's just sometimes, it's probably, I mean, I don't want to introduce the term, but it could be something called the bundle branch block. Okay, so remember you have, when it goes down into the ventricles, you have your bundle of hiss and then it splits into the two bundle branches. So you could have a situation where one of the bundle branches gets blocked. Okay. It, it could be, it could be. It's not 100%, a notched QRS doesn't always mean a bundle branch block, but it could be, okay, a bundle branch block. Um, one of the interesting things with a bundle branch block, Ernie, did you ever get the pen, the, the whiteboard pen? Yeah, it's up there. It's up there? Oh, you know what, actually? It's right here. It's on the, um, one of the handouts. Oh. I deleted them. Okay. Um, if you if you look on I thought it was here. not there, I thought it was there. Okay, so when you, when you come down into the ventricles, you have the bundle of hiss, and then it goes down into the bundle branches. And then off the bundle branches, you have all the Bikinji fibers, right? So if you get a block, so let's, let's call it a left bundle branch block. The impulse is going to come down when it goes down, and obviously they're splitting simultaneously. When it goes down here, it's going to stop. It's not going to fully depolarize the left side of the heart. This one is going to come down and depolarize like it's supposed to, continue traveling, and then pass the septal wall, come back around, and depolarize the rest of it. And there you would get a wide QRS with the bundle branch block. So that could be why we're getting that wide QRS with the notch. Whether this block is unidirectional okay, or bi-directional depends on the risk of them going into an abnormal tachycardia. So think about this for a second. Let's say that th if this was bi-directional, it's blocking in both directions, the impulse has to stop here. That's it. Can't go back upwards. If this was unidirectional where it's only stopping the impulse from going down, what's going to happen? The impulse is going to wrap back around, come and pass through it, 
by now, this is all relaxed and ready to repolarize again. And what's it going to do? Fire it up again. And it's bypassing the safety mechanism of the AV node, so it can't slow it down. And what do they go into? SVT. This is, remember, I think it was second night, we talked about re-entry phenomenons. So this is called re-entry. What does it do? It re-enters and causes it fast. So some people call it a circus dysrhythmia because it's, you know, like the clown running around in circles. So, but this is the cause of a lot of people going into tachycardias. So they have this uni, okay, directional, okay, block. It doesn't let the impulse go down, but it lets the impulse wrap back around and come back up. And this is somebody who eventually probably could get an ablation to burn out that little section where the, the block is, um, you know. So that's, that's, you know, sometimes what people, when they go into these... Uh, this is the same thing as WPW? No. WPW, WPW is not a block, is that they have an accessory pathway. What and that means is... It could, sure, it could. Okay, but WPW means it comes from the atriums down to the ventricles without going through the AV node. It's got another little bundle of nerves that occasionally it could use and bypass. When you have WPW, Typically what would happen is, so, if this is our whole heart, right? So normally you'd have SA node, AV node, and down into the heart. They have, and I'll just draw it on the outside, it's not on the outside, it's you know right in the muscle. But they have this bundle of Kent, they have this accessory pathway, and it could be, normally it's actually on this side. And what happens now is, let's say they have a normal complex, it goes down like it's supposed to, and all of a sudden someplace in the atrium fires a PAC. The PAC tries to follow the normal complex, but it doesn't let it. So what does it do? It jumps onto the accessory pathway, and it follows around, okay, and kind of going on its own, and sometimes it could work its way back up and throw the patient into a tachycardia. So that would be, uh, you know, another thing that happened in WPW. They could, they could, you know, those were classically what, when, when, I, when I was taught, the cardiologist was a, you know, a much older cardiologist. And he said those in his day of being a cardiologist before the fancy tests, if somebody's mother brought them in and said the kid keeps on fainting in school, are they faking or not faking? That was typically the diagnosis, that they'd all of a sudden go into a tachycardia in school, they'd feel a heart pounding, get all flushed, get all nervous, stand up and pass out, right? Why do they pass out when they stand up? Because it's harder to perfuse their brain. Then they'd hit the ground and they'd probably convert themselves by hitting the ground and then they'd be fine. Everybody called them a faker. So, you know, that's what, you know, that you didn't want to get in school. I wish I would have known that when I was in school because I always just say my stomach was bothering me and Sister Mary Joseph stopped believing me. She wanted a, a, school, a stool sample before I could come back to class. So, okay. Okay, and then the last heart block we had is the complete heart block or the third degree AV block, right? So again, the challenging thing is to, to, to tell the difference between the two second degrees. But here, you once again have more P waves than QRSs, but no constant P to R interval, right? So that's why it would be a complete heart block. The rate tends to be a little slower. And what would make uh, a third degree heart block one versus the other more scarier, if you had various different types of third degree heart blocks, would be the width of the QRS, the wider the QRS, means further down is becoming the escape pacemaker. So you're always worried about that it'll just stop and they'll be in just have P waves going across the screen with no QRSs and be dead. And the other thing would be the rate, okay? So this is a, you know, a, a, I would say slow, 36 is, you know, below 40, so I would call it slow, okay? And uh, it has wide QRSs, so this is probably somebody that they're gonna pretty much whisk in to get a pacemaker. Okay, let's, Let's do 10 minutes. What do we got here? 8.44. Let's do 15 minutes till 9 o'clock, and then I'll let you go. We're going to do a, a practice quiz. So nobody call out. Ah, first one is an easy one. So what do we have? We have a P wave, QRS, T wave, narrow complex. Okay, the only question we have is, is the P to R interval a little what? A little wide, okay? So we have two possible diagnoses. What do we have? Sinus bradycardia or sinus bradycardia with a first degree AV block. So let's see what our choices are. We have a, we have a sinus bradycardia. Again, we know we're calling it bradycardia because what? The heart rate's below 
60. So you have sinus bradycardia, and do they have only have a normal sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block? So since it's slow, I'm going to take a chance and probably embarrass myself and call it sinus bradycardia. Let's see. Right. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Makes me happy. Okay, so now what do we have? We have a regular but wide rhythm that's slow. So we have three possibilities idioventricular, accelerated idioventricular, or VTAC. What the what? <laughs> oh, it actually, look at that. Excellent. We got one right? Oh, because we got 100%. <laughs> That's the best thing. Pick an easy one and just do that one and stop. Okay, so this one probably would have been what? So we said it's ventricular, rate of 36. So it can't be VTAC. And it's within the normal 20 to 40 of the ventricle, so we're going to call it idioventricular, not accelerated idioventricular. Let's see if it, uh, if it starts up again with that one. We could get another 100. Nope. Okay, so this we saw before. So we have what? Pacer spike with ventricular. So we'll call this one paced ventricular. Yes? Okay. Ah, so now we got more P waves than QRSs. Okay. And do we have constant PDR intervals? No. So we call this third degree or a complete heart block? Right. Getting a little nervous pressing the buttons. <laughs> okay, so we have totally chaotic P waves, or no P waves, right? And a totally chaotic R to R's. So we call that AFib. Very good. Anybody see it? Oh, here it is. Right. Oh, we're on fire tonight. <laughs> okay, so once again, we have more P waves than QRSs. Okay, but we have constant P to R intervals. So everybody see where it is falling? All the P to So that would be a second degree type 2, and we're going to pick this one because it's not, you know, two P waves for every QRS. If it was this one, you'd have two P waves for every QRS, so it's, it's not that way. Uh, everybody knows this one. This one would have been what? A flutter. Okay, uh, bradycardia, narrow QRSs, okay, but what? No, no P waves. So this would be a junctional rhythm, right? It would not be acceler accelerated junctional, okay, because the rate is what? Should be 40 to 60, and the rate is, is 40 to 60, so we're just going to call it junctional. Oh, we just did this one, right? So this was what? We have more P waves than we have QRSs, okay? And we have constant P to R intervals, Yes, or are they changing? Okay, so we're going to call this a second degree type 2, and we'll try this 2 to 1 because there's what? Two P waves for every QRS. Right. Okay. For some reason, I keep on hearing saying Frank, not right. I don't know if I'm cracking here. <laughs> okay, so what do we have? We have an underlying P wave QRS, okay, narrow QRS. So it looks like, it looks like it's sinus, but what? the P to R intervals are fairly long. So this would have been a normal sinus rhythm with a first degree AV block. Okay. So what do we have here? We could hear by the beeping that it's a little irregular. So we have sinus, sinus, and then all of a sudden we have this extra beat. Okay. The extra beat is narrow, and there is a, what, a P wave. So it's a underlying normal sinus rhythm with a premature atrial contraction. I'd go with that one. Right. What do we have here? P, QRS, right? Everything's good, narrow P waves, normal P to R interval, T waves, nice and regular, heart rate is 72. This is what we hopefully are all in. So I really paid up to stay at 3 o'clock in the morning last night memorizing all these because I, like, I don't look like an idiot in front of you guys. <laughs> I'm sure I'll mess up at some point. Okay, so what do we got here? P wave, okay, P wave, and then we got this big pause. P wave, P wave. So this is going to be one of those ones that I, whoops. It's either going to be a sinus exit block or a sinus arrest. 
And to the life of me, I really don't know how they differentiate between the two of them because they kind of look the same. But uh, let's see, we could find it again and click on it. Oh, okay. So what do we have here? We have a fast rhythm with a wide QRS. Okay. Could be VTAC. Okay. 186 could definitely be VTAC. Okay. Um, could also be a junctional tachycardia. Okay. We don't really see any P waves. I don't know which one you want to try. You want to try VTAC? I think, it, I think it might be a junctional tachycardia. Yeah. So this is very rare to see a, you know, a rhythm like this. Okay. Um, you know, anytime you have the notched QRS, you question if the reason that the QRS is wide is not because it's ventricular in origin, but because it's a bundle branch block. That's the only reason right off the bat I said I'm not sure that it's VTAC, because that notched QRS may indicate a bundle branch block, which automatically would make your rhythm wide. The other thing it automatically also excludes you from is diagnosing a heart attack by ST elevation. Because a lot of times when they have a bundle branch block, it's going to confuse the machine and mask it. So it would be hard to be able to make that diagnosis. So you could always say to someone, that the, the, the doctor say to you that you have any kind of blocks in your heart or a bundle branch block or anything like that. They say yes, then you know it's pre-existing, it's not a problem. I'd be much more concerned with somebody who's complaining of chest pain Okay, and says, no, I just was a doctor at AKG and they said everything's normal. And now they had a new onset bundle branch block. Because that's telling you the heart attack is affecting what? The conduction pathways and their ventricle. And that's somebody who could go right into, you know, a systole or something like that. I mean, if they wind up with a bi-bundle branch block, what do they wind up with? Death. Right? If they have both, if they block both bundles, they're dead. Okay, so. Will the physical presentation be similar or? Of which one? Junctional tachycardia and SVT, absolutely the same. Would be no difference. You have a fast rhythm at a rate of 186. They'd be, they'd be calling you saying, my heart's speeding, my heart's beating. There would be no difference. That's why a safe thing would be supraventricular. You could call this a supraventricular tachycardia. It's above the ventricles. So you could safely call this a supraventricular tachycardia and nobody could say you were wrong. Okay, so what do we got here? We have narrow complexes, no P waves for every one, heart rate's a little fast, 138. No, it doesn't look like any extra beats. So what do we say? That would be, do you think this is sinus in origin? Yep. So it's probably, I would agree, a sinus tachycardia. Okay, so I got another sinus, right? P wave, QRS, T wave, PRS. Let's let it go and make sure there's no extra beats. But the heart rate is 72, so we're not going to call it sinus tachycardia. We're just going to call it a sinus rhythm. Because we got that little one over there. So what do we have here? P wave, QRS, T wave, PRS, QRS, T wave. Everything's good. Occasionally we have an extra beat. Is this a, an extra premature atrial, junctional, or ventricular contraction? So it could either be junctional or ventricular, and it's a little, there's no P wave, but it's a little wide. So I probably would have thought this would have been a PVC if we had time. Let's see if we find it again. Oh. So what do we have here? We have a fast rhythm, narrow, so we're safe to call it PSVT. The only thing I'll say to you right off the bat is if I saw that rhythm, one of the things in the back of my mind I would think right away is, is it a, a flutter? that has a one-to-one -one conduction. You see how it's real pointy? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing I would think in the back of my mind, okay? Um, it may just call it atrial tachycardia. I don't know what they're, what do they have there? Atrial flutter, paced atrial, atrial fibrillation, uh, junctional rhythm, junctional tachycardia, sinus arrhythmia, SVT. So it's probably either gonna call it SVT or A flutter would be the ones out of the choices I say here. So let's see. So let's go with uh, atrial flutter. Nope, so we'll go with SVT. Right. So, but I would always think in the back of my mind that it possibly could be because it was peaked. Okay, so we got P wave. We got P wave. Okay, QRS, P wave, QRS, but the P. 
the Peter the Peter R intervals are widening, right? And then you have what? A dropped QRS, right? So you see it widened, 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 P wave with no QRS. So this would have been a second degree type one Winky Bach. Okay, we'll do one more set and then I'll keep my word and let you go. Oh, this is a good one. So what do we have? We have a normal rate, okay? Pretty normal complexes, except what do you notice about the P waves? Okay, some of them, this is inverted. This is normal, normal. This is biphasic. You see it goes up and down? This is biphasic, inverted. So we have multiple different P waves. So now we go back to our either wandering atrial pacemaker or multifocal atrial tachycardia. The way we tell the difference between the two of those is rate. Tachycardia has to be over 100. So this has to be, it's under 100, so it has to be wandering atrial pacemaker. This was our, we saw once before, this was our pacer spike with a ventricular, so it's pacer ventricular. This one, a heart rate of 36 with a wide QRS. We call this within the ventricles, right? And since the rate is between 20 to 40, it would be just a idio, meaning within the ventricles. If the rate was faster than 40, it would be accelerated idioventricular. And if the rate was over 100, it would be VTAC. You want to do more or you want to go home? You want to go home? Okay. So, I mean, I, I had a good night's sleep, so. But anyway, thank you so much for coming.